Okay, um, so just just before I, I get cracking, apart from Sue, I, who I know uses Final Builder, is anyone else doing any kind of automated builds or or continuous integration at all? I use Final Builder for a couple of projects. Right. Maybe your hands okay. up. Okay. All right. Well, I'll just, I'm, I'm going to try and run. Yeah, it says one of 49 slides. I promise it's not actually 49 slides. It's just this, this JavaScript uh, slide thing I used. Every dot point, it turns up as, an, as a new slide sort of thing. So uh, I'll try and run through this fairly quickly and we'll get on to a demo. Um, so um, the last meeting kind of, uh, you know, we we're talking about DevOps and, and what have you, and it kind of got a little bit sidetracked onto, you know, what is DevOps? Um, I just wanted to point out that it's, it's not really a, it's not a product, it's a methodology. Mm. Um, and there's a whole, whole sphere of products that, that, that help you implement DevOps. Um, so it's, you know, it's not something that Microsoft have, have, have come up with. And it was kind of disingenuous that they renamed Visual Studio Team System to Azure DevOps. And, and then suddenly it's become shortened to just DevOps. And kind of a lot of people just think DevOps is, is a Microsoft product. You know, it's not, it's a, it's a methodology. Um, so, you know, in the past, I don't know, you guys are all my age or older probably, um, most of you. And so you've probably worked in an environment where it's certainly in larger organizations, you would have your development side and then you have your operations side and, and you pass pieces of paper and notes between each other to get things done. Um, you know, please can I mount that CD so I can actually install software, you know, and, and can you copy this onto a server? You know, and it was kind of a, you know, everybody operating in their own silos and, you know, I, I know when I was working at Mars, it was a nightmare dealing with operations people. Um, you know, you sort of, you know, fill out a request form and wait three weeks for anything to happen, you know. Um, so the, the, the whole DevOps methodology is about, is about getting, you know, development and operations to work together. Um, so that's the, you know, breaking down the side. And then, uh, you know, another part of it is, of course, automating things. Um, you know, humans are really bad at doing repetitive tasks, you know, like, Sure, you've all got a little check checklist that you used to have for, for for releasing software. You might you might still have that, you know. Copy this to here. You know, here, here's the password for that. You know, and you know, as soon as you start doing repetitive things as a human, you know, eventually you know, your mind goes for a bit of a wander and and um, and you mess up. So um, by you know automating things, basically just means that it's done correctly each time. You know. The computers don't care how boring a task is, you know. Um, and another uh, key point about DevOps is is the whole collaboration and communication. So the the whole feedback between people, you know, um, you know, you, you're deploying software and then getting feedback from the users very quickly, and then and then iterating and then deploying and getting feedback and uh, you know, and and key to that is is you know a collaborative environment where. And a lot of that is enabled by the tooling that we use. You know, people are using you know um, Slack channels and you know uh, forums and all sorts of things for that. Um, and then you know the focus on the you know on the user needs rather than the developer needs. You know, and and taking feedback in a very you know sort of you know short period of time and and you know, iterating on that. Um, so you've probably all seen this kind of a infinity thing with the DevOps thing, like just about every website that talks about DevOps has the same, same graphic, slightly modified, but um, essentially it's the same thing. I don't know if you guys can see my mouse at all. Um, yes. So, you know, we're, we're kind of, uh, you know, here in the code and the plan sort of thing, you know, we're, you know, taking user requirements and what have you, you know, converting that into code, you know, and, and using you know, um, version control systems. And then running a build, hopefully with some sort of automation, running tests with some sort of QA system, perhaps, or unit tests. And then, then we get into the, the area we're going to be talking about tonight, which is continuous integration. And I'm not going to really cover continuous deployment. Um, it's That's another sort of add on to the whole thing. And then, you know, so you're going through the release cycle, you know, going through the deployment and, and then the operations side of things. You know, you're getting into the whole, you know, hosting environments or, you know, 
deploying onto onto workstations or servers, monitoring. So that's you know you know taking feedback from the applications, uh, metrics, statistics, etc. Feeding that back into the into the planning side of things again to go on the next iteration around the whole around the track. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of what DevOps is. You know, it's kind of just a, a, a an infinite loop of of iterating. Um, you know, a continuous improvement. I guess is is, is another word term you'll hear a lot of. Um, so, what is continuous integration? So, um, this graphic really sort of uh, covers the the basics of it. Uh, starting over here on the right with the the check in changes. Um, so, you're committing a change into your version control system. Uh, you know, number two on your CI server here fetches those changes from the CI from the the, the uh, version control system. And it runs a build. It might run your unit tests, and then it'll decide whether things are good or not. Or not. Um, and then, you know, based on on the results of that that process, it'll notify the users or, or the developers, um, you know, success or failure. Uh, so, for example, it goes back to the developer here, and you know, your build failed or your unit tests failed. So the developer will fix your unit tests and make another commit and and into the version control system and your ci server will see those changes and go oh there's changes i'll build those and off it goes and around the loop again um and that's continuous integration in a nutshell there's there's plenty more to it and we haven't gotten time to cover everything on it tonight unfortunately um so there's a lot of benefits to continuous integration and and the the biggest one is is the the fast the fast feedback um how many times have you built something on your machine and you know it works on my machine? That's the, the standard phrase, isn't it? You know, and then when you when you send it out to the customers, it doesn't work. Um, you know, so it's getting fast feedback. So by building often, um, you and running your tests on the server often, you you learn more quickly when things are going badly wrong. Um, um, so and because you because you're running your tests after every build it's actually reducing risk and um you know if you look at uh, you know running on your desktop for example um you know how many times do you run all your unit tests every time you make a small code change you know you know change the procedure you know change the change the algorithm a little bit you know do you really sit and, and run all your unit tests you know for half an hour or however long they take uh every time you do that if you did that you, you wouldn't get any work done um, so the idea is that you make a change, you commit it, and then you just keep working. And in the background, you, your CI server is is running a build, it's it's running your unit tests, and it's letting you know and everyone else as well potentially, um, um, you know how that went. Um, and because it's doing that, it's easier to to find faults because you can tell when when things have changed. You know, you know, uh, and an example might be. Um, you know, build times, you know, jumped 50% on this day. And you can go and look at what commits were made or what happened on that day to make the build times go longer. Uh, and that can happen just even with the Delphi compiler, um, you know, start messing with generics or whatever, and suddenly the compiler goes really slow. Um, it's ha happened with, especially with XC4. Um, and because you're you're building often and you're you're recording the results of things like unit tests and failures and passes and you're you're, you're tracking metrics and and so you're able to track you know how how things are going progress wise and quality wise over time. Um, and then because because you've automated things, it's faster. Um, yeah, you know, and you're not dedicating a person to being the person that has to go and make a release, or you know, or spend all day preparing for a release. Um, yeah, you know, I don't know. Like before automation, um, this a dread release day. You know, it was. It was just. It was just so difficult, um, and you, you sort of avoid doing it because it was so difficult or time consuming, or and you know, and you don't want to mess up. Um, so because you've got things automated, you tend to release more often, which then feeds back into that, you know, right back up to the top here where the feedback loop is, is, uh, happening more often and faster. Um, so, um, like uh, one thing that came up on the, in the meeting last month is, you know, you know, why do I need CI as a, as a solo de developer? Um, and 
you know, there's, there's quite a good reason, like I said before, you know, do you really want to have to run all your unit tests after every small code change that you make? Um, you know, why not let a machine do it for you? Um, you know, it can be time consuming running on your dev machine uh, and, you know, letting the machine do the, the coding, mean, the, the, the testing means you can just carry on coding uh, while things happen in the background. Um, and as I said uh, just before, you know, we're, humans are terrible at, at, at repetitive tasks and we tend to mess up after a while. Mm -hmm. so, and then there's something that's come up as well in, in this, this group, uh, you know, as we're all get, getting older is, you know, is when you want to exit a software business, um, you know, and, or pass it on to new devs or, or sell the business, having a, an automated build environment actually makes makes it easier to hand it over to somebody and it makes it easier to actually sell your business. Um, if you, if you've got just some hand scribbled notes on how to build your software, uh, and then you want to go and sell that to somebody, um, then they're not going to be, or, you know, it's going to, it's going to definitely impact on a, the price that you get and b whether people are interested or not. Um, so just something to bear in mind. Um, so I, Another thing that comes up quite often is what's the difference between an auto automated build and continuous integration. And basically your, your automated build is what and how to build. So what are you building and how do you build it? Um, whereas continuous integration tends to be when to build it and where to build it. Yeah. You know, when do I, when do I start the build on, on, on what machine do I build it? Um, so I just got two distinctions there. Um, you know, CI servers tend to have operation knowledge, so they, they'll know about the environment and they'll know things about like where the FTP server is, that you know, where the deployment server is, what the passwords are to those machines. Um, whereas your build script, it, it knows about things like you know the, the folder structures, it knows how to how to compile your source code, it knows what dependencies it needs to to pull in, and so on. And your build script should be in version control with your actual source code because the build script is actually source code. doesn't matter what tool you use. Uh, it's still source code. Um, so it's, you know, it's critical that it's, it's versioned along with your source code um, because your build script script might evolve as, as your source code evolves. So your build script for version one of a product might not be the same as the build script for version two of your product. Uh, so it needs to be versioned along with your source code. Um, and it's just a uh, you know, separation of concerns. So avoid hard coding, you know, things like passwords in your CI server and in your build script. Um, putting passwords in your build script is a, is a really bad idea because you're putting that into version control, which is there forever, you know, uh, for somebody to go and look up. Um, maybe not outside people, but even maybe you know, team members who shouldn't have access to things. Um, so yeah, passing, passing in variables. Okay. So, you know, let's go have a quick look at the, the actual build script side of things. You know, what, what do you use? Um, I'm going to come out right out of the bat and say, I don't recommend batch files, um, you know, for a, a number of reasons, um, like the old arcane syntax, um, just a little backstory for me. I started working on final builder in 1999 because a team member I was working with at Medicare wrote batch files for, for, for our release process. And then he went traveling for three months and I couldn't understand these batch files. Um, they were just you know, ridiculous. I mean, they did everything it needed to do. Just nobody, nobody could edit it. Nobody could figure out how to fix it when it, when it wasn't working properly. Um, uh, one plus side for batch files is it's procedural and I'll get to why that's a plus in, in a minute. Um, so another option might be PowerShell or, or another scripting language like Python or, or Lua or you know, all sorts of things. Um, so better than batch files, are not designed for builds. So you're basically coding everything from scratch. So, you know, running routines to do file copying and running routines to call the compiler and so on. Um, you're basically going to be writing Docker when you want to hand it over as well. Um, Procedural, so that's a good, that's a plus. It's, it makes it, it makes it easy to, to to follow the flow of of the build process. Um, and if you think of your, your build process or your, your build script as a as a procedure or a, or a program, then you want to be able to you know look at the code and understand what it does. 
Um, MS Build. <laughs> okay, so all Delphi projects are an MS Build project. Um, the the dproj file is an MS Build project. Um, so it's, so you, you're talking about XML. Um, unfortunately, you can't change all the settings from the command line, only some of them. And good luck finding out know, what they're called. Um, yeah, I usually do that by opening up the dproj and notepad and, and having a look at what the settings are. But you have to go and change a setting in the IDE to, to make it be persisted. If it's not the default, it might not be there in the in the dproj file. Um, so Delphi, the way it uses MS Build is, is kind of a mess to do with um, configurations. So because uh, Delphi uses a thing called the inheritance in in its configuration. So mm -hmm. you know build. Uh, you know the the, uh, the debug inherits from the base one, and then and then if you create a new configuration, that inherits from debug. And depending on where on which configuration you're on at the time, depends on where it saves things in the file or whether it saves it. Um, so when you're trying to find what a setting is for a particular configuration in in the the, the XML, it's quite hard to to reason which setting is actually in effect. If it, it may have been overridden and it uses just like key key underscore one or cfg underscore one rather than you know the name so you've got to go and work your way back up the tree trying to trying to figure out you know what things are um so it's kind of horrible and the worst part is that there's no way to set the version info from the command line um so you basically have to edit the xml file um to change the version info uh, unless you manage uh, a, a resource file yourself, um, in which case you're turning off the, the project res um, for, for Delphi. And then you've got to manage things like icons and that as well yourself. And then also you need to configure your environment uh, variables correctly for, for the MS build, build script to actually work correctly. Um, it's declarative, which means that you're know, trying to understand what happens when in in uh, in an MS build uh, file is quite difficult. Um, so you basically got to try and work out the the, 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 uh, the dependency tree of the targets. Um, and yeah, it's good luck. That's all I can say. Um, now of course, uh, shameless plug here um, for Final Builder. Um, so it's a visual interface, um, simple to learn. At least I think it is, and most users you know, don't seem to have problems learning it. Um, so you can debug your build, which you can't do with with MS build, um, other than just turning on verbose mode and, and then pouring through reams and reams of logs. Um, and the cool thing about Final Builder is that you can design and debug your, your build process, your build script on your desktop. And then that same script can run on your build server. Um, so you can have Final Builder installed on your CI server, and it can run that build script as a, you know, from the command line. Um, and it's fairly self-documenting. Um, you can look at a Final Builder uh, project and, and fairly quickly understand what it does. Um, so, you know, this, for example, this is this is part of the Final Builder eight um, build process for doing the code signing part of things. Um, and so you can see things like, you know, if, else, you know, exit loop and so on. Uh, so it's fairly easy to understand what it's doing um, once you've used Final Builder for a few minutes. Um, and it's procedural, you know, um, so it's like a typical program flow. I say mostly because there is a dependencies feature where it will build, it will do things it because it depends. So. Uh, if you have a build target that depends on a clean target, then it will run the clean target first before it runs your build target. Um, so a bit like MS build, but it's kind of a hybrid model. Okay, so getting on to you know what we're really here for is continuous CI, which is our continuous integration server. Um, so there's a free version, so you guys can download it and get started for at no cost. It has some some minor limitations, um, so a single concurrent build um, in the free version um, just means you can't run more than one build process at a time. Um, it doesn't mean that they won't run; it just means they'll queue until until there's the, there's a, a, an agent available. And 
Continua uses a, a it's a multi-process environment. So there's a server process, there's an agent process, which can the agents can run on multiple machines. Um, and once you start having licenses, you can have as many uh, agents as you want, and, and that can be quite useful for for accessing tools where you know, for example, you might have a tool that's really expensive and you only have one license. You can install a build agent on that machine, and whenever a, a build needs that particular tool it'll run it on that particular build agent. Uh, so there's unlimited projects and configurations and unlimited users, even in the free version. Um, so the only real limitation is, is uh, the single current concurrent build. And there are some actions that are not available if you don't have a license. Um, so we, yeah, it's li license per concurrent build. Uh, oh. Uh, typo there, but anyways, a single license unlo unlocks unlimited build agents. Um, okay, time for a demo. Uh, just bear with me, I'll get the right windows up. Okay, so we're actually going to install. Can you can you guys see the installer window there? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're actually going to install Continua quickly um, and then get started with it. So the installer checks to see that I've I've got IIS installed. I've got some features that, that IIS um, needs, the .NET framework and so on. Um, and then I'm just going to just bear with me while I hack my typing away here. I'm just going to use an existing share folder and I'll use the bundled Postgres database and forms installation. So this is installing the server component um, and the next, the next bit will be installing the, the, that's installing the database. And then we'll run the agent installer quickly. And I'll just change that to be. Uh, so 80, 80, I think was it? Should be starting up just about now. Oh, you're kidding! <laughs> I've, I've done this like three times today. <laughs> I share. Uh, I know what it is. I think when I uninstalled it, it deleted the share folder. All right. Uh, where are we sharing? It's interesting that it still saw the share. Wouldn't be a demo without a failure. Something always has to go wrong. Yes, I get it over and done with early in the demo. There we go. All right, so we need a user.
Okay, so uh, you know, you can see that you know, obviously I whizzed through it because I've done it like a million times before. Um, but there isn't too much to installing uh, Continue, and we do have quite a lot of help on on the website for that. Um, so once you've uh, created a user and signed in, um, you you basically need to create a project, and a pr project is a container for configurations. Um, so we'll call this a Doug. A Doug and save and continue. Okay, so we're, we're just going to skip out of this now. We don't need to create any any of this stuff here at the moment. And I'm going to create a configuration. So we'll call this. So configuration is the is basically your build process, your CI process. CI demo. We'll enable it. Save and continue. Okay, so we need to point. Point it at uh, continue at a repository. So we we'll call this uh, CI demo. It's going to be pointing at a Git repository. I'm going to have to skip through this really quick, otherwise we'll be here all night. Um, Git repository. I'm just going to copy and paste. There's one I prepared earlier. I don't need any credentials for this. Just make sure that's correct. All right, so we, I've got a, a demo repo that I set up on, on GitHub this afternoon for this. And you'll see down here, it actually says it's initializing the repository here. So what it's actually doing is cloning that, that Git repository down onto the CI server. And that's ready to go. And I'll just add one more, which is going to be required for our test here, which is oh, X. That's also a Git repository. And it's an old repository, so the default branch is still master. I think that's all we need on that one. Actually, and I'll just go and edit this one here quickly. I'll just make it poll the, the repository a bit quicker so that we can get changes quicker. So th this is the repository that we're actually monitoring, is it? Yes, that's right. So I've set up two repositories here, one for you know, my, my project source code and one in this case, one for a library's uh, source code. Yeah. Um, so you know, the the idea is is when we commit into into your library, I'm oh, sorry, into your project source uh, repository here, Continue will see that you've committed and it can do something about it. Yeah. Um, so we have different levels of pro. So you can, if you've got a, a repository that's shared, so I really this um, this uh, DNNX could be shared between multiple projects rather than just that one that one. The multiple configurations rather yep. so I could actually pro move that up, up to be a project repository so it's available by, for other configurations and then you can have global ones as well um though I tend not to use those that much um we'll skip over the variables but you can create different variable types here um so for example passwords um um, so stages is basically where your build, where your your CI connects to your build process. Um, so we do things in here. Um, for example, um, we can call MS Build to build things. Um, so let's let's point it at our uh, source dot CI demo actually and. Should be able to find our dproj there. So it's going to build Win32. So I'm just going to demo using just this is not using Final Builder with Continue, just using MS Build. Um, so we're going to need a bunch of environment variables to get MS Build to work. Um, so these will be you know, these will be you know, basically coming from you know, the old you know, RS vars batch file that is in your bin folder, in your, in your Delphi bin folder. Um, and just have a look, see if there's any other 
properties. Oh yeah, we want to change. I want to change our um, output folder to Windows two. So again, this is a you know um, figuring out um, properties for your MS build file by opening up your dproj file, um, and looking at at these names. And then you've got to work out, okay, so this is in the base configuration. You know, has it been overridden in somewhere else in the wall of text? Um, this is why I'm not a fan of, of MS Bill. Um, I think that's probably all we need for that to get it to build. Um, and then we'll, I've got, you know, I want to build for for win 64 as well. So we'll change that properties, change that to win 64. And I think that's all we need for that. Okay, we'll skip event handlers. It's kind of an advanced topic. So triggers are how, how you know, what to do when, when, uh, you know, you know, how does a build get started? So you can start it manually by clicking on the play button, or you can react to, to things, you know, from uh, from other builds or from a repository, which is what we're going to do in this case. So, so CR demo, and we're going to point it at our, our CR demo thing. And I'll just change that quiet period. So the, the quiet interval is basically, um, you know, collect all the changes until till we haven't had a commit for five minutes or one minute or whatever it's set to. And so, you know, um, if, you, if you set this to zero, then it builds on every commit. If you set it to, you know, five minutes, then then it'll wait five minutes for a quiet period. So nobody's checked in anything in the last five minutes. Okay, let's build. Um, so that's all we need on that. And let's... Okay, so in theory, I can press. So there's two ways to start a build up the top right hand side here. Um, this one brings up the queue options and allows you to do things like select different branches and so on. I don't have any other branches at the moment. Um, or you can just click the fast forward one and away she goes. And so we can go and look in here. So it's actually Ran so quick, I couldn't keep up with it. Um, so we can come in here and see that actually it did build those two projects. Um, it didn't collect any artifacts, so we need to go and look at that. So let's go back in. So up here, so by default, when you first start the project or configuration, rather, you just have this one stage here, uh, the build stage. And if you double click on that, or you can click on edit stage options. It gives you this dialogue, which then allows you to do things like um, control what files get put into your workspace from your source control um, you know, using the repository rules. What files? So, so the build actually happens on the agent. In this case, the agent is on the same machine as the server, but in a production environment, in a team environment, anyway, you're more likely to have um, agents on a bunch of virtual machines or, or you know, spread around, uh, around the building on different machines, and so. When the build starts and final build in Continua, it actually sends the source code to the agent uh, and the build script and 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 the settings that we've configured here and says, please build this and then let me know when you're done. Um, so you can control you know what files get moved backwards and forwards between the the the, the agent and the server. For example, you might not want the entire repository checked out on the agent, and you you might not want all the all the binaries that were built on this on the agent to be sent back to the server workspace so you can use these rules to to um you know, speed things up a bit basically um so artifacts are basically the uh, the output of your build process um so in this case here we actually want to get our output uh, got See, so star star means rec uh, recursive. So I think let me just validate that. And let's do a turn on logging there. So so I mean, what happened there was on, the, on this first build was that the build happened on the agent, but it didn't send any of the resulting files back to the server because we didn't tell it to. Um, 
And so actually, I think we need to also uh, just go back in there. Oh, we already have a default rule there to copy the output. Okay, so let's yeah. run a build there again. Let's see if I can get on there quickly. So, so it's oh, down, it's quick. Okay, so now if we look at artifacts here, we have our two resulting um, executable files, Win32 and Win64. I can download those files if I want. Um, so that's a basic build process there. Um, so if we open up Delphi here and um, where's the files for the pro oh, it's a console program. Let's, um, let's make a change to our code and commit it. Uh, no, not that one. Um, so I just want to close that quickly. Right. Oh. Okay, so that's push that to GitHub. And if we look at back in our repositories here, we should see this polling in a second. All right, so it's getting change sets, updating a cache. And then you can see we've got a build triggered here, but it says it's awaiting uh, queue conditions. It's in the quiet period. So I don't want to wait the five minutes to see if there's going to be any more check-ins. So I'm just going to skip the quiet period by clicking on that little button on the right-hand side there. And now our build process just ran. So that build process was triggered by me committing source code into, into GitHub. Um, and if we come in here, we can actually see the change sets that, that, um, uh, that actually were associated with this particular build. And, this is the files that changed in that in that particular commit. Um, that's the commit from DUNX from the, from the repository that that's associated with it, and uh, artifacts. And because we, as, if we look at this change here, the DUNX commit actually had in its commit message here, it said fixed issue three one eight exit behavior default. Um, Continuous picked that up here as an issue under the issues tab. And so if I click on that link, it'll take us to the issue on GitHub. Um, and you can hook it up to other issue trackers like Jira and, and so on as well. So it just generates a URL that you can, a link that you can click on to go to the issue. Um, okay, so um, just looking on my notes here quickly. So if we go back into uh, stage here quickly. So as I said before in the in the slides, the limitation with MS Build is I, I don't have any way of controlling the um, the version information with with uh, with MS Build. So I'm going to switch to to using Final Builder. So I have my Final Builder build script already in the in the repository, and Continue can go and look at look at the repositories and go and find. Find a build script. Find a find a bit of a build script there. So that's the what that's the one I want to use. And I'm going to want to add some variables to our build process here. So basically, what I'm doing here is I'm passing in some version info from Continuer into Find a Builder. I'm telling it uh, where the output folder is going to be, um, where to find the DUNX source code. Um, ideally, you'd be using a package manager, but we won't go there. Um, <laughs> I'm going to tell it to log, export the log to uh, workspace. That'll do, and register it as a report. So we'll see, be able to see the log file exported as well. I don't think I need any other options there. Um, so let's, uh, let's save that. Uh, 
and trigger another build. So every time you start a build manually, at least anyway, it'll go and poll the repositories and, and get the latest source code um, from those repositories. Okay, so our build process did uh, complete there. So we can come and see it. So it actually ran final builder. It took in some some variables from Continua. And then here's the actual log, which is kind of hard to view in here, the, the Delphi log, the, the Continua log rather. So I tend to, oh, why didn't that work? Should have picked up a report. Let me have a look. Ah, I know why. Uh, export log. Got to actually give it a name. Uh, the path, just the path. I oh, know. Uh, try that again. Okay, here we go. So now we've got our, our final build of log in a in a slightly better presented format. And you can change the theme when you export it to light or dark. Um, okay, so that's that's a really basic demo. Um, uh, I guess that the other thing we might want to do is we might want to run our unit tests. Um, so we did actually build them in that in in. Uh, I'll open up Final Builder here again and just show. This is this is basically that Final Builder build script. Really simple. So define defining a property set. Uh, to take our version info uh, numbers, um, I'm taking the values we've received from Continua, putting them into the pop into the property set. Uh, this is just sending some status information to to um, Continua. The delay is just so that you can see it happen in Continua, because otherwise it just happens so quickly, because it's a really small project. Um, and then our project in in uh, sorry uh, uh, delphi action here is actually linked link the version information from that property set so it'll take the, the version information generated from continua which actually i didn't really show you guys that but uh, it basically has an auto incrementing build number um thing here but you know, there's a whole bunch of expressions that you can use to to dynamically create build build versions based on different uh, schemes like .NET, the Win32, you can use the year and month and day and uh, a million different ways to do it. Um, so, and so this is my, if I, I'm just going to run this here on my, on my local machine. So just to show that I can run my final build script here locally. And then um, because I've configured it using some variables, um, so everything with relative paths, um when it runs on on the ci server it just works even though every build runs in a separate folder every build creates a workspace folder um for for, the, for a build to run so that it doesn't impact on our other builds running um so you know you're not sort of overwriting files you know, if, if multiple builds are running at the same time so i think what we might do here is just quickly um add some unit tests in here so i'm going to add another stage here I'll call it test um and i'll explain a little bit about the stages in a second as well so this let's, let's um execute uh um our tests and our tests are going to be in dollar workspace uh out output win 32 slash what did i call my tests Demo tests. And I'll we'll just put that a working folder of that. Um, and then we want to bring our unit test results in. And I've already set up my, uh, my unit test project here. 
just using the DNNX wizard to create create this particular project, and it's so it's by default it's set set up to use an n unit logger, which creates an n unit compatible XML, and um, Anyway, where were we? So back to the web page. So I'm going to import those test results and they will be in actually workspace. Just cheat on the user. I actually probably want to grab them from the correct folder. Okay, so so um, the stages are basically like allowing you to create the sort of a logical separation of different parts of your of your build process. So build, test, deploy, for example, um, or it might be build, test, code sign, deploy. Um, and so if the build fails, it's not going to go and run the unit test, for example. And this little section here in between the, the stages is called the stage gate. And if we click on it, it allows you to define some rules um, yeah, to determine whether or not to continue on to the next stage or not. So, for example, the default rules are, you know, no failed unit tests, you know, um, uh, or no, no, you know, the fact that your build is successful. Um, and so that allows you to, you know, you know, stop things, you know, by control. You, know, you might actually say, I don't care if there's failing tests, move on to the next stage. You know, I'm still in development. I'm still working, getting things, you know, running. I don't, I don't want it to stop because my, my unit tests are failing. I know they're failing and I'll deal with it, you know. Uh, but in production environment and release environment, you obviously you don't want to be releasing when your unit tests are failing. Um, so that's what the stage gate does. And then so it allows you to, to and you can also control um, so for example, uh, promotion options. So you can actually say I always go to the next stage or you can actually say, uh, if, I, if I untick that, then it'll stop after this uh, build stage and I have to manually go and start it again to run the next stage. Um, so there might be something you, that you cannot automate and you need to manually do. Um, so to give you an example of that, um, so if we look at our production and uh, build process for final builder, I actually have it set to not deploy automatically. Um, pretty sure it's set to, oh no, it does. No, where are we? Yeah, so it's turned, the, the automatic promotion's turned off, so it doesn't deploy every build. So I have to manually go in and to determine whether to deploy and the same with the, the chocolatey publish uh, uh, stage as well. So, so one thing you'll notice here is that, you know, there's not much to the, to the CI part of things as far as in the, in the stage, uh, you know, the actions in the stage, uh, you know, ideally most of your, your, um, your build process should be done in your build script, not your, not in the CI server. Um, so let's get back to um, where were we? So running our unit tests. So let's see if that works. Uh, why did that fail? Let's go and have a look at the log. Ah, I know what it is. So our unit test exit uh, failed. Uh, um, it's because the D unit X process basically returned a non-zero exit code. Um, so obviously it didn't continue on from there. Um, so what we need to do here is say uh, less than or equal to one. So that we actually continue on and, and actually import the the unit test results. And it failed, and it failed because we have failing unit tests. So there's three tests total, one passed, 
two failed and we can drill in and see which test failed. Um, and there's two new failures because it hasn't seen these failures before. So now I set this up this afternoon so that these tests would, would actually fail um, on purpose. Um, so what I'll do is I'll fix that test. I've got a test case here that's taking in two values that are, that are definitely not equal. So, um, so let's go and um, just close the project. Okay, so. Mm. Watch the shepherd and oh. I don't know if you do. You don't have to. I just put what? it on the wire on the. What? What's the okay, point? so I've pushed the fix for that now. So if we come back in here, go back out to the home screen, shows you a tile for each configuration, and if we, and you can drill in, so you can drill into the configuration. Uh, if we look at the repositories, it should be grabbing change sets about now because it polls every 30 seconds. And and it's triggered a build, but it's in the quiet period, but we're not going to use the quiet period. I should have set that to zero. And let's build that. And we're green. So we've got two green stages here. So if we drill in here now, you can see that there's three passed, passing tests, two fixed tests. So it, it automatically knows that these tests were failing before and they're now working. So it's telling you that. Um, and again, uh, we can see our, our artifacts here. So we can see our, our executables. Um, probably could have excluded the unit test executables. Don't really need to download that again. Um, and so on. So there's a there's a whole lot more to Continua than than what I'm showing you here. Um, the home screen has different views for different preferences. So the, the detail view, list view, and then there's, then there's a builds view that will show you um, what's going on, you know, at, on your server at, at the moment. Up the top here, it's showing that there's there's only one agent available. If I click on that, I can drill into the agent. Um, uh, agents have uh, what's what's called property collectors, where they'll go off and examine themselves um, based on the, what the server tells them about, and say, you know, what do you support? What what uh, tools do you know about? Um, do you have Delphi installed, for example? Uh, and they generate properties which we can use to inspect on the server to determine, you know, which agent machine we send a build to. So there's no point sending a build to an agent that doesn't have Delphi installed, for example. Um, so it generates thousands and thousands of properties um, but you can filter them. So if I go search for Delphi, then you can see that it knows, you know, these are the versions of Delphi I have installed on my machine at the moment. Um, uh, and you can also specify, so we go back out to the, to the actual, oh, no, sorry, not that one. Let's come in here and edit the stages. I can also specify agent requirements in here and say, well, actually, I need dollar agent dot Delphi eleven exists Delphi eleven dot All right, so you know, basically, I'm saying that this this uh, this configuration will only run on an agent that has Delphi eleven installed. Um, so if actually, if I change that, let's change it um, to say Delphi 10.2. I can't remember why we made them so, so verbose, but anyway, um, if I save that now and try and run a build, in fact, we can actually just come on, on here onto agents and, oh, of course, it's going to run on that on, on my machine because I have all those versions installed. Um, what version don't I have installed? Stages. Um, I, I don't have Delphi 7 installed. So if we come on here now, 
you can see that it's um, saying there's, there's no agent that's compatible with, with this configuration, so I can't run this build at the moment. Um, so if I had another agent installed, you know, if I had a license installed um, that had Delphi 7 installed on it, for example, then it would know to be able to, to build this project that it needs to send it to that agent with Delphi 7 installed. Um, what else can we see? Um, so events are thing are useful for doing things like um, um, updating GitHub, marking a, a project as release as a release, or integrating with uh, tools like Octopus Deploy, uh, which is more on the continuous delivery side of things, um, or just um, tagging a repository ch change sets, which can be useful. Um, you need right permission to do that, so I'm not going to set that up here now, but but you can actually tag tag a, a, a commit with the version information, for example. So um, if I look at on a builder, for example, um, so we uh, ta write tags. No, actually, it's not a good example. Let's look at um, let's look at continue a release. Let's look at changes here. So you can see these tags here were created with that, that uh, event handler. So this basically means this was a released version that was actually uploaded to the website. And then we tag the commit to say, you know, what which commit uh, is associated with particular release that we put out. So it's good. It's a good, a good way of being able to go back and find rather than just using dates. Oh, we released on, you know, February the 12th, you know, it's what commit actually was, was used to create this build. Not, not, you know, not what, not, I might have made 50 commits on that day. Which one was the build? You know, um, and so that's supported. I think that the build tagging is supported. I think for uh, where are we? Events build tag. She doesn't show. You. I think. I think it depends on the repository type, but I think it's. Uh, Mercurial, Git, and Subversion, I think, support tagging at least. Uh, anyway, I have to check on that. Um, so other build event handlers, so updating status on, on GitHub, for example. Um, where are we? So where is my DNX one? I ran a build on on the DNX project um, earlier on today, and it updated the the link, the, the status on GitHub. And so if we went to GitHub and look at the DNX, if we look at uh, branches. So you click there and it shows that it was actually built successfully with a continuer build number. Um, so that's just a simple example of things you can do with it. Um, but yes, there's a lot more to that to do with things like um, uh, rules on your repositories, for example, um, controlling which files it looks at, which branches, you know, um, tagging of, of, of builds based on which branch it uses, um, setting variables based on the branch name. And there's, there's so many dynamic features that I couldn't possibly show all of them here. Uh, but the things like um, shared resources, for example, um, where are we? See our server. Uh, shared resources. Where are they? Yeah. So shared resources are a way of doing blocking. For example, um, I talked about my my blog post the other day about the the using code signing with the USB tokens. Um, you know, you only want one build at a time or, uh, or one file at a time being signed. The USB token can only be used by one process at a time. So you would create a shared resource and then create a lock on that resource temporarily while doing the signing and then, and then unlock it. So it's basically reserving a resource. Um, and there's, there's a whole lot uh, to do with um, security, with user access roles and uh, groups and so on. Um, continuous support to LDAP, you know, Active Directory. So if you're in a, an organization, it's, you can use Active Directory to control access to Continuer as well. Um, 
There's an event log which will put something here when something goes wrong. Uh, where are we? Notifications. So I didn't cover no notifications. Um, so notifications creating basically a publisher. So email and then specifying email and then we can go and say okay the mail server and then you can create subscriptions so you can you know i want to be notified about these events or, or that happen on the build server um you know it might be uh slack you know so publish to a slack channel uh you know so yeah you know, which we do here as well so we have, have our builds notifying to our slack channel you know when things go wrong because that's what we use for messaging between uh, team members and yeah, you know, it just works. So, but these are, these are the ones that we support at the moment. Although stride, I think is, and, um, no, hip chat is gone. That was discontinued by Atlassian for some reason. Um, XMPP. So any questions? Graham had cool. a question about whether you can use SVN rather than Git. Or... Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if I go, let's go back in here, uh, find the repository, create a repository. So when you're creating a repository, you specify the type. So these are the version control systems that we support. You know, Bazaar, which is not that popular these days, Git, Mercurial, Perforce, Plastic SEM. Subversion, surround, team foundation server, and vault. So pretty much covers most that are in use these days. Um, mm. Well, a lot of those now. I mean, most people are pretty much using subversion, Git, or Mercurial these days. Um, the the uh, team foundation server, which is now you know Visual Studio Online or Azure or whatever they, DevOps, whatever they want to call it. Even even that, they they're pushing people towards using Git now as well. So. Um, Vincent. Yes. Um, are you actually recreating the build scripts, or are you using existing, you know, stuff that's being laid down to to run all this? Uh, what do you mean recreating? Um, when we talk about MS build scripts and you know Delphi, are you just running the yeah the the the, the Delphi remotely as it were? Yeah. So these these ones here. Basically, I just pointed it at the dproj file. I just told MS Build to run that, and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, but you know, as I pointed out, there's limitations when you do that. Though, as far as changing settings and and uh, managing version control, you're going to have to do some more stuff yourself to manage the version control, uh, the the version info stuff. Um, which is why, yeah, I recommend using something like Find a Build or even a, even a PowerShell script would be better than. Than just using MS Builder. Oh, okay. So Final Builder is yeah, okay. Yeah. Right. So Final Builder is this is Final Builder. This is so it's basically a visual uh, build script development environment. Um, so when when this is the 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 um the IDE for it, but when when Continuo runs it, it just runs the console version of it. Oh, okay. So yeah, I couldn't quite work out what the connection was. Yeah. So they're separate products. Um, yeah, you can. So Sue has been using Final Builder for years, and she just uses Final Builder. She doesn't use Continuous CI. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah, so the thing is, you know, with the the whole um, you know CI versus automated builds. You know, it was the, you know the automated build knows how to build things and what to build, and your CI server tells you when to build it and and where to build it, basically. Mm -hmm. The, the main or one of the reasons that I never quite got around to using CI um, was the fact that I've got my Delphi at a VM and the way I understood it that you probably would run CI on a different machine and I wasn't sure how to run Delphi on the other machine that it's not installed on. That's uh, possible. But, yeah um it basically just involves copying a bunch of files and a few registry entries right um, so our, our build agents ha all have uh 
I think they've got XC7, uh, 10, uh, 10 4, 2 and and eleven two. I think installed at the moment. Not installed, sorry. I mean deployed to the build agents. Um, so it's it's possible to to do that without installing it and using up an activation um, side of things. Right. And it is legal. There is actually a, a a build server license thing that you know, they started doing with. I uh, can't remember which version it was. At one stage, they were going to provide an installer for installing the the, the compiler onto the onto the um, build server, but they never did do that. Um, probably worried about licensing. I don't know. Like, yeah. So, so if I install CI onto a separate machine, you don't uh, have to though. You can put it onto your onto your. Uh, so, is it, do you use one VM or do you use multiple VMs? Um, at the moment, I'm only using one. You can put continue onto that VM. Um, Oh, Windows 11. I was right-clicking the taskbar to get my my um, task manager. Um, so let's have a look at. All right. Okay. So here's the here's the um, processes that are, that's using. So the, the server is using 150 megs. The agent's using 70 megs. Um, the SSH server, you, you actually don't need it if you're just running solo because it's only used for when you're using remote agents. Um, and then there's also the Postgres. Postgres is funny. It's a because it's, it's a Linux thing. It um it launches multiple processes, and, and I've got the Postgres from Continua and also Postgres the, the, that I've installed separately on this machine. So it's hard to tell how much memory it's actually using. Um, I think it's. I can't remember which ones. Anyway, so it's it's not heavy resource wise on your machine. Um, you know, it's less than two hundred megabytes compared to when you've got probably eight gigs or more of RAM on your machine. And, yeah. And then when a build's running, it's not using a whole lot of CPU other than like Delphi is. You know, the, it's the Delphi yeah. compiler that's, that's using the CPU. So. Can uh, this be connected to, you know, GitHub where they can display, you know, building and, and passing tests and that sort of thing? Yep. Yeah. I just, you must have been out, out, out driving around on that, uh, that bit. I just showed that about 10 minutes ago. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'll review the video. Uh, Vincent, uh, if you miss the right click on the taskbar to bring up the process list, uh, there's a shortcut key, uh, control shift escape. That's the same thing. Okay. Um, uh, I yeah. asked that question to our IT guy as well. He came up with that. It's great. And then he sent a message after saying, uh, in future releases of 11, most likely they're going to bring that right click back. Yeah, because uh, uh, it's uh, annoying. <laughs> I did actually have um, um, uh, like a third party product installed to actually bring that back, but it, it expired yeah. today. So yeah, that's why. <laughs> this is too many people who missed this. But start all the after escape does the job for now. Yeah. yeah. Like I managed to get um, like the, the um, context menu to back today just by hacking the registry. So uh, yeah, um, I, did, I did the same. Uh, I want to have it expanded as well and not shortened. It's useless. You have to click twice. Yeah, it was so, driving drive me nuts. Two clicks yeah. for everything. Yeah. This is the first thing I did is uh, fiddle with the registry to get rid of that and so the whole yeah. thing. Yeah. Oh, well, everything else is pretty much the same, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was just talking to a colleague today and I was like, I don't really notice much difference between Windows 11 and 10, to be honest, yeah. performance wise or feature wise. Just they move some cheese, that's all. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> And you said there's a fair bit of um, help on the the website for for getting going with it because you went through a fair amount of material in a fairly short space of time there. Yeah, I, I, I was kind of I, you know I, I cut my slides down quite a bit to try and leave more time for the actual demo thing as well. So yeah, um, but there's just so much to cover. So there's quite a lot of stuff here on the wiki. Um, to do with con concepts, uh, installation, you know, yeah, you know, actually using, and then you know, some a couple of tutorials and um, and so on. 
is I suspect it's rather like Final Builder, that it's one of those things that you can easily get something simple up and running, but it takes, as you need more, you find there's so much more in it that you can do and you just build yeah. on your knowledge. Yeah, you don't have to do everything at once. No, no, um, you don't. So not not to get um, overwhelmed by the capabilities of it, but just to yeah. start simple. Because um, my first first final builder projects were very simple, and then I think, oh, I want to do something else and play around with it, and they they build up over time with help from examples and questions and things like that. Yeah, I just um just something I, I talked about in the when I was had the slides up um, about recording metrics um, over time. Um, so you can see here, this is um like I don't think it goes back to. I think we rebuilt the, ser the our production server in 2019. So, but you can see our build activity. You know, obviously we lots of activity in the last in the last um, few months. We're ramping up, working on a new version. So, um, you know, so there's a number of builds today, you know, um, per day, and so on. And then you can see things like um, tracking build dur duration, which can be, you know, uh, you know, a build taking longer than usual can be a can be a, a warning sign that something's going wrong, either, you know, with your environment or with with your build process or with the compiler, for example. Yeah. Um, things like um, tracking the time, how long a build stays on the build queue. You know, if if builds are staying on the queue a long time, then you probably need more licenses or and so on, or more agents. Yeah. Uh, like a build agent can run multiple builds uh, concurrently. Um, where are we? And then, so this is our production server at the moment. So we've only got four agents running at the moment and then the other ones, test ones that have come and gone. Um, and if I look at this compatibility matrix, it'll be quite slow because I've been used for a bit. Um, you know, it's, you know, it gives you a report of what, you know, what can build where, um, when you've got multiple agents with different capabilities, um, it's quite useful information to have. Um, well, we turned off a bunch of agents recently because we just weren't, weren't really using them. You know, didn't need that many agents, but we have customers who have hundreds of agents deployed. Um, we find uh, customers find ways to, to use the product in ways we hadn't envisaged. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Isn't that always the way? Yeah. Vincent, what's the price point for the commercial version? Uh, so a, a single concurrent license is, is $199, I think, US. So that that the, what that does though is it unlocks the unlimited agents feature, which is can be quite useful. Um, but you, you'll find that um, like uh, for a small team, half the time you, you know if you're not doing um, a lot of builds, the one concurrent build is actually fine. So it's worthwhile starting up just with the free version, see how you go. Um, so the other thing that um, Stages. So the, when you have a license, it also opens up a bunch of other actions that you can use in here as well to do with things like Azure and um, uh, SFTP. Uh, file transfer. So this, you know, file transfer using different protocols and so on. So that's only available if you have a license. Um, but we kind of, even though we've added these features, you know, because people wanted them, um, we kind of discourage people from, from creating complex, you know, build scripts in here. We'd rather they just, you know, really just should, should just be like one action, you know, execute program, run something else, you know, um, and have you, most of your build definition, your build script should be external to your CI server. Richard's got a question in the chat, Vincent. Oh, so I just got to find that my view is. Is there documentation on installing Delphi on a build server so it does not need a license? Uh, there, 
Might be. I'll see what I can find and put it on the forums tomorrow. Um, I've done it quite a few times, so I've kind of got um, got some, you know, I export some registry keys and hack it about, and um, it's not it's not too difficult. How many people are interested in giving it a go? I think I'd be interested in giving um, Final Builder a go. That yeah, costs more. Oh, oh! <laughs> you didn't show the prices for that, did you? No. Where are we? Prices are in US dollars, by the way. So that that would be the one you'd be looking at. So that there is a difference between the um, the standard and the and the um, the professional version of uh, Final Builder, mostly to do with what actions are available. So, I just like to say that I reckon that Final Builder has actually saved has saved me a man year a year in the amount of work it's done for me. It was one of the best value for money. I'm busy redoing the website at the moment, uh, Sue, so I'll have to quote you on that when I do the testimonial section. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but just just the the fact that all of these things could be run without you having to think and to know that they were being done properly so that you could you could spend your time developing and writing new tests rather than running the old ones. Machines don't get bored. No, they don't. And they don't look out the window and lose their train of thought. <laughs> yeah, that does happen. <laughs> well, for me anyway. Any other questions? Sometimes uh, Windows updates and stuff have, um, I mean, the only VM I've used is um, VirtualBox. And occasionally a Windows update and then VirtualBox won't start. Um, it's been a little while, but then then they update it and then you can run it again. Um, have you found, you know, like operating system changes that have uh, thrown a spanner in the works for you over the time? Uh, yeah, occasionally, but not not really. No, nothing that's um, that's been majorly blocking. Um, so Continua is written in .NET um, 4, no, 4.7, I think it is. Um, it's final build is written in, in Delphi XE7 at the moment. So, um, but I've not really had any major issues uh, you know, that I can think of, not recently anyway. If I were to ask you whether it would be possible to um, compile free Pascal, should one wash out one's mouth with soap or should mm -hmm. could one get an answer of is there a way perhaps using execute in final builder that might you can use the execute program um yeah. action to do that but you just got to figure out the command line uh, options for for um free pascal yeah i've not I've, I've really not invested any time in it because it's not really um our target demographic i guess um you know um People using Free Pascal are generally not paying for for dev tools. Um, I think we've had I mean, we get maybe like one request a year for it, if that. Yeah, and, just... and yours yours would be the first one this year. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just curious because a number of people seem to be switching to Pascal as they retire because they can't afford Delphi anymore, and. Uh, wondering having having final builder whether if i start playing with this and doing things with it whether i can uh, continue to use it i'll have a play yeah when i, when I let, get to let, it let me know when you get when you, how you get on i will it'll, it'll be a little while yet i'm too busy playing with the adug software at the moment oh, okay do, do people use your software with C++ Builder? Yes. Not many, though. That's just 
probably because there's not many C++ build developers. Yeah. And I'm assuming a .NET would be fairly simple as well. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I've got it building oh. some .NET projects. Where are we? Continue and release. Can I see it? So this is, uh, this is continue building itself use and continues written in .NET. So yeah, so I, I didn't do this. I, I wouldn't, I, I, this was just more about dog fooding the product rather than best practice here. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't be adding all this into continuum myself. I would just have one final builder action in here. Um, and have the, the build process external, but of course we have to actually use the product to make sure it works. So, um, but yes, so here we go running MS build, you know, to run the product, running part, different part, uh, building different parts of the product. So yeah, it's pretty easy to build. Uh, um, in fact, if you look on the website, uh, where are we? Go onto the continuous CI page. This this video here it pops up a YouTube video, which I'll spare you the agony of now because it's got a painful soundtrack. But that's uh, like um, actually demos doing what I did tonight, but with a .NET project, with a, a Visual Studio project. So this is a good example of using stages here. So where um, if we look at this uh, Obfuscate uh, um, stage. There'll be an agent requirement here that says that we only run this stage on the on the Herc, on the machine called Hercules, and that's because it's the only machine only machine that has Smart Assembly installed because we only have one license for it because um, it's like two thousand dollars. So we didn't want to build buy a license for every build agent. Um, so and then test. And packaging, deploy, sending, you know, so we're using Final Builder to run the deployment part side of things. So that build script will be, uh, have all the, the, uh, the actions to upload it to the website and so on. Um, this will be using, so here it's doing tagging of, re, uh, of the repository. So it's tagging it with a version, version build, version, you know, and so on release yeah so that's what creates those tags on the change sets um when we actually do a, a deployment so, so when to run it will be on deploy so so we only tag the repository when that when a build actually gets sent to the website um so for release builds so we look at the changes here so that's these tags here Were they automatically set or did you have to manually change the version number? No, that was done automatically. It was configured in that, in that um, event handler um, okay. settings. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's using this. Um, so this is using, using uh, expressions here in, in um, continue. Right. So you get this like IntelliSense type thing. Yeah. Build version. And so on. Yeah. Cancel that. Triggers. So then we've got a bunch of triggers on this particular one with diff on different repositories. Uh, conditions. No, we're not using those there. Security. Again, we're just using global things. Uh, one thing I didn't cover was cleanup. Um, so um, let's just quickly go back to this one. Yeah, cleanup. So. Um, yeah, you know, because each build work uh, happens in a in a separate um, um, workspace folder, you en you can end up end up with a lot of files on your on your hard drive that you don't you know you only want for a very short period of time. So these these cleanup rules allow you to define how long those files hang around for, and then what parts of the build you clean up. So, for example, if, um, if you, you know cleaning up uh, artifacts like you know your executables and so on that you're never going to deploy, like they were just test builds. Um, you might want to just clean them up every, every every day or every week, or you know, just so your hard drive doesn't fill up, basically. So, so it just happens in the background. Um, it's based on you know scheduled thing. So, 
and you can override it based on, you know, clean up the database, just clean up all the unit tests or statistics or clean up files, log files and so on. And, and then how long you want them to hang around for, you know, keep a, num a minimum number of builds. So you can, you've got something to see in your, in your, in your um, status page. So, uh, so that's, you know, the history. So we've only got a few builds there, but if I come back into, um, into the continue uh, release with the history there, and then we've got pages and pages of builds, you know, so. Yeah, cleanup's quite important. Reports is, uh, is quite another thing. We do, I did actually show that very quickly today with the uh, showing the, the, the you know the final builder log being exported and appearing as a report. But it's quite useful for things like um, code coverage tool, like Delphi code, code coverage. It spits out a bunch of HTML files, so you can configure those so they show up here as as a, as a code coverage report, um, and then you can view them inside Continua. Um, so we, we have quite a lot of customers that use those with with the, the .NET projects with the code coverage tools that they have available. So, yeah. mm. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, I got one more. The uh, agent is that a Windows uh, only agent, or is there uh, a Linux version as well? There's. <laughs> I knew somebody was going to ask it. Um, it's Windows only at the moment. The next version, uh, probably after the first release. We'll have a Linux agent. We're basically rewriting everything in .NET Core, um, which sounds like it should be really simple, but this was an ASP.NET MVC app that we started in 2012, I think. So quite a lot of, um, of technical debt to, to get past. Um, so yes, the plan is to have the agents running on Linux and Mac, Mac OS as well. Oh, cool, that opens new possibilities, yeah. Vincent, could you please go over the uh, question of whether Final Builder works with uh, Free Pasco again, please, and or can it be extended to work with Free Pasco? Um, it it doesn't have built-in support for Free Pasco, um, but it can be extended. I don't have any plans to do that myself at the moment. Um, I mean, one way to do it would be just to run the execute program action and point it at the compiler and 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 put fill in the parameters yourself. Um, and the reason I said that I don't have any plans to support it is I don't see um, any customers there really. Um, people using Free Pascal are not necessarily buying paying for dev tools. Um, if I was getting lots of requests for it, I, I would, but um, we get one one or two a year, so. Um, you can extend uh, findability, you can create your own actions um, using Action Studio. So we actually use this to create actions ourselves. So for example, this, right. I've just loaded up the Action Studio here. I was having a look at the VMware actions today. Um, so you can find some, yeah. It's basically just a little, little uh, JavaScript to, um, studio thing, or you can use Java. Um, so if we go, let's go file new and new, new action. So you can specify um, JavaScript. I don't recommend VBScript these days. And then all you can do .NET or, or uh, PowerShell, or you can actually point it out a C Sharp assembly and write the code in C Sharp as well. Um, which we do for some actions as well. And then the UI is always done in script. So, and there's base actions basically that you decide on. Um, so a standard action basically has, oh, so this one I actually pointed out a .NET assembly. So let's, oh no, new action. So let's just do active script based. So then you just fill in, you know, on execute on validate, on loaded, property change, and so on, and then create property pages here. So let's create a new property page, and you get a form designer with with components and so on. So it's not it's not the most intuitive tool in the world, and I, I'm about halfway through rewriting it to make it look more modern and a bit easier to use. But it's a long, it's quite a it's, it's quite a massive 
project in, in, in and of itself. So you could write your own free Pascal action if you wanted to. Thank you. But the first step would be to um, work out how to do it with execute. Yeah, obviously you just got you got to learn the the command line basically um, to be able to, to interact with the tool. So, which is what you know ninety percent of the actions in Final Builder do is just talk to a command line. Um, so it's, oh, that's probably not a good example of looking at that, but you know, and you get actions. You go and look at them, all of them. They'll be uh, get the command, work out the command line based on the properties, and and it has this command line builder object that you can use to add arguments and so on, and then interpreting the result and so on, and then bind, binding. Uh, UI fields to properties. So mm. I don't think we have much in the way of Docker for this. We did do have a PDF somewhere with a, with a basic manual from like the, you know, the first version, I think it was just hasn't been kept up to date. Um, so. this, this, this interesting Docker was actually the reason why I asked a question for the agent on a, on a Linux platform. Because Docker, Docker functions better on Linux, uh, not so much on Windows. But then what you could do is so you take a, a Docker image and you put a compiler in the image and you call the yeah. image to let the, the work. So you still check out your source code and then you use Docker to compile it and then you flush the compiler after. Yeah, that. Well, absolutely we want to have a Docker image with a continuous agent on it. <laughs> oh, you yeah. embed the whole oh, uh, the agent in the Docker image. Yeah, yeah was, why not? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I was thinking compiler. Yeah. And well, then, well, compiler and the agent. I mean, you know, I mean, you create a Docker image with what you need to build and then, yeah. then you're running builds in, in Docker containers and you can spin them up very quickly then. Um, so at the moment, yeah, so what happens is when you spin up an agent, is it it um it talks to the server and so if we come into yeah, there must be some port that it talks over through some yeah obviously protocol. they need they need to care they need to uh to to know about each other so yeah the, um usually what happens when you spin up a new agent it'll come up as 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 uh, available here but not not out not authorized it'll say unauthorized um mm -hmm. so um and you have to authorize it. So in in um, in V two, we're actually using certificate thumbprints to actually you know you know authenticate between the agent and the server. Um, so obviously, if we do do things where we're spinning up agents in Docker containers, we're going to need to to change something about that as well. But um, but it, it would allow you to scale up builds like dramatically um, because you can spin up an agent much quicker than you can spin up a VM. Uh, yeah, Docker container, so I can go up. Much yeah, quicker. yeah, it's uh, it's instance is run straight away. It's it's just a yeah. process. There's no virtual yeah. layer in between. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, but but also you can tag all the um, images, so you can put any compiler and any version in there, and then if there's a new version, you can just retag it and start using yeah, the new right, version yeah. of the compiler. So you have yeah. that managed. Um, yeah, interesting. Yeah. So I I use Docker at home on my home server. Um, example as. That's um that's running in a Docker container. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, energies. <laughs> cool. Yeah, so this is my, my energy usage for the day. This is this is home home assistant. And it's just it's just talking to my my solar um, inverter. Yeah. So this is just a web server in a container. Yeah, and that's that's running on a on a on a um um on a uh, Zen server, like a um, XCPNG, which is a uh, open source version of Zen server. Okay. Um, so I just the server running in my garage. So. Yeah, I've, I've um, been doing a lot more work with with uh, with Linux now in the last you know, like few months. Just really getting into groups. I've I've used Linux many times over the years, but never really seriously. Um, I've, I'm sort of getting getting more used to it now. Um, one of the, one of the reasons for that is, is, is that, um, so our, our servers in the data center in Sydney are all running Hyper-V server. Um, but they, they're starting to get a bit long in the tooth. So we're looking at replacing them and, and, uh, you know, what do we put on there? Because Microsoft have discontinued the Hyper-V server. Um, 
So I've been looking at maybe using a different hypervisor. So I've been playing with the, the Zen server, the XCPNG, which is really, really good. But it doesn't support um, Windows 11 at the moment. So it's a bit of a problem. So, but it might do by the time I, I actually really need it. So. Any more questions? Oh, I think that's, I think you've just um, filled us with so much information, Vincent, that we're just a little bit stunned at the moment. <laughs> okay. No, that was, that was really interesting. Mm. But certainly something to think about. Um, and I think to have a play with, I'm, I'm keen to have a bit of a, a fiddle with it. Um, well, if you were in Canberra still, I'd come around and give you, and give you a demo. But yeah, you moved away, far. so yeah, yeah. No, well, I, uh, there's no point in doing it with the the system I've currently got in Final Builder because it's just a an end of life type product these days. But um, I'm still doing a little bit of other coding and playing, which I'd be interested in in just trying this out and seeing how it goes. So if anybody else is going to have a go, maybe we can communicate on the forum or something and swap notes. So, uh, yeah, well, thanks very much for for a really interesting talk. Yeah. And no I, hope, I hope Roger, although Roger's at, at uh, Melbourne in person, that this answers a bit more questions about sort of DevOps and how, how we can automate things.